Everyone, welcome to this session. I think it's going to be a very interesting session given uh, what's been happening in recent events. Obviously, this was a topic of great interest already, and judging from the attendance, it still is. Um, we'll be talking about rethinking economic growth. Uh, as you know, President Obama has called inequality the defining issue of our time. He was speaking, I think, mostly about America, but it turns out this is an issue across the region, and particularly in Southeast Asia. And I would be remiss to say that uh, events last night have underscored this issue to some extent. I think it's, it's pretty obvious that the events in Thailand, if you look at their roots, have their roots in a growing income gap, both between urban and rural, a geographic divide, and a divide between the rich and poor in an economy that until recently was doing very, very well and now seems to have stumbled upon the very limitations of its own growth model. This is unfortunately a problem that we have all across ASEAN. If you look at the Gini coefficients for the region, you'll find that Thailand is not exceptionally uh, high compared to other countries. It is relatively high. It's actually on a par with the United States. And Indonesia's is actually better. I will say better is other than higher. It's a little less unequal. And the Philippines, the country we're in now, is actually the worst of them all. So this is a pretty germane issue. We want to talk a little bit about what's gone wrong with the model. Have we focused a little bit too much on uh, GDP, gross domestic product, as a measure of progress and success for Asia's fast-growing economies? Uh, or do we need a new, it's definitely clear we need a new approach. And what we want to try to focus on is how to get there. So we have a very distinguished panel uh, with us today. Let me introduce them. Uh, to my left, we have Professor Fu Jun. Uh, from uh, an executive dean and professor and of the School of Government at Peking University in Beijing. Uh, he's also a, a co-chair of the Global Agenda Council on New Growth Models. And I want to point you all to the report that he helped write on this subject, which after this meeting, if you want to go and read more on the subject, I can give you the URL. I'll read it out right now for those of you who want to have a pen and can write it. It's uh, http colon uh, double slash no triple w wef dot ch backslash ngm for new growth models. Uh, here on my right is Mr. Nandu Nankishore, the Executive Vice President uh, for Asia, Oceania, Oceania, Africa, and Middle East at Nestle, coming to us from Switzerland. Uh, here is uh, Vice, Senior Vice Minister of the Cabinet Office of Japan, Mr. Yasutoshi Nishimura. Nishimura-san, welcome. To my right, Jeremy Sheldon, Managing Director of Markets in the Asia Pacific for Jones Lang LaSalle. He is a fellow resident of Hong Kong. And to my immediate left, Mr. Naoyuki Shinohara, the Deputy Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund in Washington, D.C. Directly in front of me, Ms. Shinta Wijaya Kamdani, the Chief Executive Officer of Sintesa Group in uh, Jakarta, and also a member of the Global Agenda Council for Southeast Asia. I'm Wayne Arnold. I'm the Asia Economics Correspondent at the Wall Street Journal in Hong Kong. So let's get started. We'll go around the room. I think we should start with Professor Fu Jun. Uh, Professor, tell us what is wrong with the approach we've had. Have we put too much emphasis on GDP as an indicator of progress? And how do we achieve a better, balanced, and more sustainable growth model going forward? Uh, thank you very much, and I'm very happy to have uh, th this opportunity to say a bit of uh, the work we've done uh, for the new growth model. It's a, a part of uh, the Global Agenda Council of uh, the World Economic Forum. Uh, the, the way we approach that question is uh, we look at existing models. Uh, well, at the risk of uh, oversimplification, uh, uh, we look at uh, the standard textbook uh, model of growth. Growth is a function of land, labor, capital. It's a standard growth model. And under that model, you can think of uh, two modes. One is extensive uh, modes, mode of development. The other is intensive mode of development. So we begin by identifying holes and the gaps in the existing model. And we, what we found is now, if you sort of uh, go systematically uh, by looking at that model uh, in the variable of land, uh, the practice of that model uh, has not been sensitive uh, enough to the carrying capacity of the Earth. Mm. In other words, we need to have uh, better mechanisms uh, to better price uh, resources, given the economic principles of uh, prices uh, a function of uh, scarcity. Uh, if we move on from that variable to labor, uh, you are, there you're talking about a human capital. Uh, it seems to uh, us 
there are many uh, labor-saving technologies instead of a technology progress, but not enough uh, earth-saving technologies. So there is a hole there, there is a gap there. And in the variable of uh, uh, capital, uh, if not theoretically, but in practice, if the return rates of capital is systematically higher than real economic uh, growth rates, then the model cannot be sustained. Or if the growth rates of a highly leveraged investment is systematically higher than real return rates of capital, uh, the model can not be sustained. But either way, uh, it's a case of inflation. And in the case of inflation, it is a very secretive and a powerful way of transfer of wealth. Okay. And the result being, you see a widening gap between rich and the poor. It's in a question not just domestically, but uh, internationally. So uh, another gap that we see is you now, if you look at a standard model, that model uh, looks Einstein, very mechanical. Uh, it's not sensitive to the field. And there we are talking about institutions. Now, if you have really level playing ground, you can gain in terms of uh, allocative efficiency. So in that report, we have a special chapter on institutional learning and uh, institutional uh, innovation. So this is the uh, sort of diagnosis uh, uh, we have of the existing model. Now, we'll, we'll come up with a new model. I quote new uh, here. But as a tool of uh, communication, effective communication, I would call our new model a give model, mm -hmm. a model that gives. G stands for green, I stands for inclusiveness, uh, V stands for value. We need to have a change of uh, mindset. Uh, growth is not only about efficiency, it's also about equity, uh, fairness. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, well, if you talk about human well-being, you're talking about health, education, employment, political freedom, social relationship, environmental quality and security. Uh, and E, give the last term, E stands for ecosystem. And we need to uh, build a better ecosystem to, mo to promote entrepreneurship and innovation at the micro level. And more at the uh, mac macro level, we need to better calibrate <coughs> the role of a state or global governance uh, for the same matter, vis-a-vis -vis the role of uh, the marketplace uh, because in terms of the environment, uh, it's a public good. Uh, and uh, uh, we need to have a hierarchy, a better global governance to deal with uh, externalities. And this is uh, what we have. But uh, uh, we have a report out uh, early uh, this year in the annual uh, Davos meeting there. So I, I guess I have to stop here. Please, we'll come back to you. Okay. Shina Hara-san, can I turn to you? Can you elaborate a little bit more on sustainability, both in terms of the inequities of incomes we've seen, in terms of the environmental sustainability? What has fit, what, how has GDP as a measure failed us? Well, as, as we all know, GDP is a very, uh, how do I put it, uh, wonderful, uh, delicate. Uh, set of the indexes that covers a uh, you know, whole range of economic indicators. But of course it has uh, its own uh, limitations. For example, it doesn't measure the transactions that are not through the market mechanism, like uh, you know, household work that, 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 that doesn't go out of the house, you know, it is not measured in the GDP. Uh, how, to, how the income is distributed. It's not uh, the issue related to the GDP. <coughs> that is not included. Uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Fujin says, uh, uh, environmental degradation, mm -hmm. uh, so-called externalities, are not in the GDP. So GDP has its own limitations, uh, but GDP is still a very elegant instrument to measure how the economy is working. Uh, from the IMS, IMS view, viewpoint, uh, we work on GDP mainly. But if you look at uh, programs in Europe after the European financial crisis, we have had several programs in Europe. And increasingly, the issue of social inclusion, the issue of unemployment, the issue of uh, income inequality is a big issue in order to make the programs successful. 
When in the program, we talk about finan uh, fiscal uh, consolidation, we talk about monetary tightening, but it has certainly impacts on the people, especially on the poorer section of the society. And that is why there were huge demonstrations in Greece and other countries, and that makes it very difficult for the program to go through. And that is why the program design has to be very carefully calibrated in order to measure the impacts of those uh, macroeconomic policies on the poorer section of the economy. So the program includes lots of measures to, uh, uh, for social protection mm -hmm. and things like that. So the issue of social inclusion, the issue of inequality uh, is part of our agenda now in order to make the economic growth sustainable. So it is not just the GDP, but other measures that we need to take into account in our, uh, okay. activities as well. Let's come back to you on that issue as well. Uh, Nandu, let me ask you about this. You have often talked, and Nestle has often talked about, the real costs that need to be factored of resources. Can you address this when it comes to sustainability and equitable Sorry, growth? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Sure. Um, um, you've often talked about the real cost of resources, particularly water. Can you talk about how that fits in with this debate about sustainability and equitable <coughs> growth? Okay, I'll, I'll uh, be happy to talk about that. Let's first start with some of the concepts uh, that Fu Jun and Chinuara San already introduced. Uh, this whole conference is focused on the theme of inclusive growth, where we need to move GDPs elegant, but we need to move beyond that to other measures on longer health, uh, education, uh, employment, uh, millennium development goals, uh, and, and, and so on. Now, one of the fundamental, and this of course has responsibilities for all stakeholders, government, industry, and so on. One of the fundamental beliefs in Nestle of the way we approach business is that the only way we can sustainably create value for our shareholders, and the word sustainably is very important. The only way we can sustainably create value for our shareholders is if we simultaneously create value for the society in which we operate. And this includes all stakeholders. In the case of Nestle, if I refer back then to some of the themes that Fu Jun touched upon, and then I'll come to your sustainability point. Fu Jun touched upon the theme of uh, employment, health, and education. Let's talk about these three themes. In the case of Nestle, we focus what we call our creating shared value efforts on rural development, mm -hmm. on water, and on nutrition. Why these three? First, rural development. Uh, what people tend to overlook is when it comes to uh, the, uh, employment as a measure of inclusive growth, 90% of all employment in the world is created by the private sector. Mm -hmm. And one of the largest employers in the world is the rural agriculture sector. In ASEAN, something like 37% of people are employed in the agriculture sector. Nestle, as a food and beverage company, has a natural linkage back into the farm. We work directly with 700,000 farmers directly who get paid on a daily basis and have cash transfers on a daily basis. And that's the best way to provide them a livelihood provide them sustainability, education to make sure they improve productivity and income, and eventually the dignity that allows them to live a full life. So that's a huge pillar of how we work. Mm -hmm. Let me talk about nutrition, then I come to sustainability sure. and water. Uh, nutrition is core to Nestle, and it's part of our DNA. Now, if I go to the measures of inclusive growth and health, for instance, one of the uh, a, a few, few, few facts. Huh? Today we have something like a billion and a half people, particularly in the subtropical belt, who are malnourished, where you have stunting rates in children of the order of 35 to 40 percent. And this is a public health crisis that is shameful, which can be prevented simply by addressing micronutrient deficiencies and macronutrient deficiencies. And this is something we in Nestle are able to help government address by fortification of our products, removing the bad stuff, the sugar, the salt, uh, the trans fatty, saturated, and adding some of the good stuff, uh, the micronutrient deficiencies that are really required by these populations. And uh, we have, for instance, uh, something like 
200 million servings a day of fortified products sold only in West Africa, which help to uh, alleviate some of the micronutrient deficiencies in population, whether it's iron or zinc or iodine or vitamin A. The other burden of disease is the, the obesity and non-communicable disease crisis. And uh, again, it's ironical that you have a billion and a half people who are overweight or obese, and these numbers are rising. The fastest growing disease we have in society is diabetes. And this is a very important measure of inclusive growth. How do we cope with health? This requires science. It requires an understanding of nutrition science, physio human physiology. It requires educating stakeholders, governments, opinion leaders, civil society, and consumers. And it requires a, a complete reformulation of the kind of products that are offered to society. And that's a huge area that we work in. Then I come to water, which was the question that you raised. Uh, the world, I, I heard a startling statistic two days ago in the Grow Asia Forum, uh, which I was co-chairing. In the next 40 years, simply to cope with the increase in population, today 7 billion going to 9.5 billion by 2050. We, in the next 40 years, the world has to produce as much food as we have produced in the last 4,000 years. Hmm. Just think about that. The next 40 years, as much food as the last 4,000 years. Yeah? For many reasons, we basically need to double a production of food on an annual basis between now and the year 2050. What do you need for food production? Well, I, akin to the economics model, the growth model that Fu Jun put forward, you need land. We aren't making any more of it. In fact, we are degrading it. Yeah. We need sunshine. There's plenty of that around. We need people and we need water. And these are the two scarce resources. People, because children of farmers don't want to be farmers. Farmers don't want their children to follow them simply because of lack of sustainability and the high risk nature of the entire agricultural model, smallholder farm model that exists today. Mm -hmm. But water, 70% of all the fresh water used by mankind is used for agriculture, to grow food. Today, already as mankind, we use fresh water which is 10% in excess of the replenishment level. So we're tapping into aquifers that have been built over millennia. Mm. The forecast is that by 2030, we as mankind, to grow food, will be using fresh water at a rate that is 60% higher than replenishment levels. So man has survived for millennia without iron, without silicon, and without uh, oil and carbon. We can't survive more than two days without water. Hmm. And yet we are looking at a scenario where over the next 30 years, the most precious commodity in the world will be water. So pricing and access will become huge political issues. They already are. So start with sustainability right. is the first issue. To make sure that water use is sustainable in order to, to produce the kind of food so we can feed the world and we have food security. Not only food security, to go back to the previous point of the double burden of disease, we have nutrient security in the right measure in the right mm. place. And to produce that, we need really to very closely create a multi-stakeholder uh, engagement platform to make sure the use of water resources is sustainable. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the uh, key platforms, the three <laughs> platforms I mentioned, rural development, nutrition, and water that Nestle uh, works on as part of our creating shared value program to mm -hmm. make sure that we create value for society and that's the only way we can sustainably create value for our shareholders. Let me, let me come back to you then on how you can apply that in some of the countries in this region. Um, Jeremy, let me turn to you. We're on the subject of sustainability and you talked about some of the human rights of water and nutrients being one of them. You talked to mention land specifically. Jeremy, what's been happening in that space and how is that contributing to the increasing disparities of income and the unequal levels of growth we're seeing in the region? access to Jones, property. Um, Jones Lang and Sal are a, a property advisory company. So we uh, advise on, on various elements related to the built environment primarily. And I think that within um, the industry as a whole, what we have been endeavoring to do is to greenify, for want of a better word, the built environment. 
uh, 30 percent of carbon emissions globally come from buildings and therefore from that perspective we are uh, the, the, the development community um, are looking very closely at how to measure uh, the, their impact and so there is a, a significant push from, from governments um, as climate change is being acknowledged as being a big issue to work out how can one can do that efficiently how do we make sure that, that we take that carbon footprint down within the built environment. Within the workplace, um, you're finding a lot of individuals, especially the younger generation, are wanting a more productive workplace. So from their point of view, um, uh, there's an <laughs> interesting, uh, I was at a conference uh, last week where talking about wellness and uh, very much related to the, to the human capital piece, uh, we're getting to a point now where Obviously, um, sitting, sitting at work is, is perceived as uh, one of the issues related to obesity and, and such like. People are now having desks that you stand up. Well, actually, in America, you've got desks with treadmills, and they are fixed at four kilometers an hour. This is why we're in the round here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So as, soon as, we, as soon as, soon as we get up, that, that's... So I, I think from, from that point of view, the real estate industry is, is endeavoring to, to make sure that um, both from a development standpoint and from a, uh, an, uh, uh, an occupational standpoint, that one is aware of it. And it's being driven both from a government standpoint but also from an investor standpoint. The reality is, as we go forward, as more regulation uh, is pro provided in this area, the reality between those buildings that cannot provide that sort of sustainable uh, measurement versus those that can are going to see, uh, I think, in due course, a premium. And so that you f start to find that um, those impositions are being put in. And it's important that there's, there's strong governance mm -hmm. from that point of view at a, at a, at a, um, at a political level. Um, so that you understand exactly what you do and where you may be able to, as I say, get benefits as a consequence of that. Okay. Shinta, I have to turn to you on Indonesia then, because this is, this is obviously the largest country in our region one of the most important and obviously one of the most, the most challenging environmental problems and sustainability problems. And as I mentioned, even though its Gini coefficient is better than Thailand's, it's by no means considered, I think, acceptable. How would you address this issue? Well, first of all, um, I think the timing, right? Uh, if you see 2015 is um, last year of the UN MDG, as mentioned. And also at the same time, we are approaching AAC, which is the uh, ASEAN Economic Community. And if we look at all the work that has been done as far as the MDG is concerned, of course, we have half the extreme uh, property level. We have increased uh, significantly, even in Asia, in terms of attendance of uh, primary school. So I think um, you have seen some progress in, in, in that area. Now, uh, we understand that now we're moving from um, the MDG to the sustainable development goal. So I think this is something that in Indonesia, we're trying to put this as basically our aim, how Indonesia can be part in achieving these sustainable development goals. And, and when we look at um, the three uh, basic components of uh, sustainable development on the economic growth, on the social inclusion, as well on the environmental sustainability, um, we see that Indonesia is perhaps um, one of the country that is still far behind in this, in this sense. Um, but what we're trying to achieve is now having an alignment between the different component of stakeholders in achieving this. So when we, we think what kind of growth, of course we, don't, we no longer focus on just economic growth. So we wanna focus on this, but how then we can align between the different um, uh, stakeholders in Indonesia. So one um, area that I would like to share is now, um, the government have the national development agenda. And we, we realize that one area, if we want to make this happen on a more concrete programs, is how to bring this SDG inside of our national development agenda. So that's what we did. I represent, I'm actually um, the vice chairman also of the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And I've been asked to champion um, sustainable development um, actions. And I think one of the area that is important is this uh, putting this as the national development agenda of Indonesia and then bringing in some of the uh, programs that we can develop in achieving the SDG. So 
we are happy now to, 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 to kind of aim the same goal. You know, and, and, and then from the private sector side, we also have created what we call the Fashion 2050. Mm -hmm. Because we, we, we look at all this um, uh, demography issue, we, we see the increase of, uh, we will have a bonus demography. And I think globally, um, as mentioned, we will reach 9.5 billion people. And that's a huge amount of numbers. So what are we doing in anticipation of that? And I think... Um, uh, it is very important uh, because we've been talking a lot about you know how we want to go, but I think it's important that this alignment is taking place. That when we talk about uh, the government, private sector, NGO, academia, we're talking about the same language and we are driving to the same direction. And I think um, this is where uh, I feel is very important when we, we when we discuss you know education, when we talk about jobs, uh, when we talk about uh, social security. You know, this all will involve, I mean, it cannot be just a government driving it. You know, it has to come from the multi-stakeholders. And mm -hmm. I think um, enough said, you know, enough has been said. And I think we, we really in Indonesia want to, to see how we can bring this forward. And um, we are also integrating with the region. And I think this is why I mentioned about the AAC, because it's part of what we're doing in WEF. And I'm a part of the Global uh, Council member of WEF uh, in, in South Asia. We're trying to facilitate this process as well on the ASEAN integration aspect because we feel there's a big gap and where the government is sitting right now with thinking that they're achieving 70, 80% of KPI and where private sector is lying, thinking that we're only achieving like 10, 20%. So mm. how can we then, you know, sit and, and see what is missing here, you know? And I think... Um, Definitely, the role of WEF is very important in facilitating some of this integration process. Mm, thanks. I'm interested in this issue of government KPIs. In, in, in your report, Professor uh, Fujin, you mentioned several different alternative indicators that we could be looking at to sort of augment our understanding of how governments are doing at their job of trying to create not just growth, but quality growth. And uh, one of the, three of these, I noticed, were from the World Bank. Um, there is an adjusted net savings indicator, yep. there is a human opportunity index, and there is a shared prosperity indicator. Now, are, those, are these the silver bullets that we need to sort of reevaluate government progress on growth? Well, these uh, certainly are the indicators uh, that we have included in our report. And our report actually uh, starts with uh, a chapter on matrix first. And we think it's important because uh, uh, a change of mindset is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, growth should not be uh, exclusively driven by efficiency. Uh, for a country or for a nation to uh, move forward, uh, they face uh, simultaneously the goal of efficiency, uh, the goal of uh, justice or equity, and the goal of uh, freedom. Uh, so if you think of uh, human development, human uh, wellness, uh, social dimensions, economic dimensions, um, and also be sensitive to uh, environmental quality and mm. the security. Shin Harrison, can we use these indicators in terms of evaluating? I mean, if you were to do your annual analysis of, of policymakers, would it be possible to incorporate these indexes into their progress in the I mean, Article the, 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 yeah. consultations and... There, there, are, there are many indexes uh, being developed uh, by various institutions. So each of them has its own good uh, features. But uh, overall, I, I think it is very difficult at this moment to pick up uh, some of the indexes to be used for policy purposes. We, uh, I, I just want to emphasize the importance of uh, uh, income distribution. Mm. Uh, in Asia, for example, uh, Gini coefficient you talked about, income inequality is rising mm -hmm. in most of the countries in Asia, especially in countries with uh, large populations. I don't want to pick up names here, but, uh, but and this is the issue that a, the countries in Asia need to deal with one way or another. Mm. Uh, needless to say, this is not the issue particular to Asia. It is, the issue, it is the global issue now, and it is at the center of the global public debate mm -hmm. uh, at this moment. But uh, and, uh, this debate applies to Asia as well. Uh, you know, if you look at the countries in Asia, uh, 
the size of the government is relatively small. That means that uh, the role of the government uh, that plays in, in allocation of income is relatively small compared to other regions. Mm -hmm. Why is that? I think it is partly uh, the choice of the governments, the choice of the people to have smaller tax revenue, to have smaller size of the government. But at the same time, it has a lot to do with uh, uh, not enough tax revenues, mm -hmm. weak tax administration, huge amounts of tax exemptions, uh, what else? Uh, you know, those things and, uh, you know, lots of red tapes, things like that, I think that uh, uh, discussed among us uh, a very long time, but uh, that is one area that the governments in this region has to deal with. Uh, the other issue that we need to take a look is that uh, uh, fiscal policy plays a big role mm. in addressing the issue of income inequality. Uh, in case of advanced economies, we have enough data to do some empirical studies. Uh, but it shows that uh, taxation and uh, income transfer uh, in the area of social programs would reduce uh, uh, the income inequality by one third. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how it applies to you know, developing countries at this moment. Uh, fiscal policy plays a big role in addressing the issue of inequality. And that is clearly related to the issue of sustainability. There is, I, I just want to point out another empirical study that shows that if income inequality is high, mm -hmm. Uh, and that income inequality is associated with the shorter duration of high economic growth. That means that if, the, you know, if you have a situation with high income inequality, you might be able to enjoy a very high growth for a short period of time, but it is not sustainable. It doesn't last for a long period. And that issue is related to, for, ex for example, middle income trap and things like that. Do you think can I add something to that? Before we do that, let me, let me turn, this is a perfect opportunity to turn to Nishimura-san, because I think Japan is undergoing a very important experiment. It reminds us this is not a developing country issue. Um, this is an issue that developed countries also face, and Japan is undertaking a lot of policies that address exactly what I think you've talked about. And what's interesting also to me is that Japan, which has for decades had a reputation for having one of the most egalitarian societies or homogeneous societies from an income base, it's also seen a rising income disparity. And now in April, Nishimura-san, I know you uh, raised your value-added tax. And value-added tax, I know, is being considered uh, by the Asian Development Bank, and I believe also by your colleagues at the, at the IMF, as one way to try to increase the tax base and use that money to spread the wealth. So I want to get your perspectives on how that's working out, what your thinking is. It, is, it was very unpopular, and a lot of economists worry that this is going to upend your economic recovery. So is it justified from the point of view of sustainability and sustainable growth from Japan for Japan going forward? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So let me talk about first uh, effort, uh, uh, our efforts towards uh, inclusive and sustainable um, development, I mean, growth. So as you said, uh, Japan is uh, traditionally a very um, uh, inclusive society with a low unemployment rate and uh, small income gap and uh, advanced environmental technology. So um, now we are, uh, our government is working to enhance this advantage in the uh, new growth strategy. And uh, for example, the unemployment, uh, unemployment rates currently stays at 3.6% which is uh, relatively low in, by international standard, uh, partly reflecting the efforts of uh, for, uh, companies uh, to keep their employees in, in their uh, own company. Uh, the farmers' efforts to keep their employees contribute to the stability of our society. But on the other hand, it tends to reduce uh, their profitability. Uh, uh, profitability. And uh, I mean, yes. Uh, so. Now we are trying to, what we are trying to do is uh, uh, to facilitate the transfer of our uh, labor force to new growing industries. Although um, uh, one billion US dollars have been spent for supporting companies to keep their employees, uh, we will 
uh, now we are uh, changing the disallocation of resources uh, to, uh, so as to spend one billion US dollars for uh, supporting job creation and labor mobility in the future. And now the, uh, we are facing the, uh, the big challenge we are facing is uh, demography. So population is uh, uh, decreasing in the world, but uh, our population is decreasing, uh, increasing in the world, but our population is decreasing. And now we, our population is uh, uh, 125 million uh, people. But uh, in 2060, uh, naturally, it will be uh, 86 million. So it's a big uh, decrease. So we are now the how, thinking how to, of how to uh, manage and overcome this challenge. And uh, uh, so what, what uh, we have to do is uh, uh, increase the female participation in labor force, uh, which is uh, relatively low uh, by the international standards. So we are increasing our uh, social, um, child care uh, services, and also supporting the uh, women who want to work and, uh, and uh, who want to work. So uh, that's a big challenge for us. And uh, uh, also, uh, we have to uh, implement uh, physical consolidation. Mm. So we need to uh, increase, uh, uh, I mean, consumer tax. Uh, relatively low uh, in, in the international standard. I mean, uh, we added the tax at three percent to eight percent in this uh, in the last month, April. Uh, now the eighty-eight percent, and we are think, uh, we are trying we are planning to uh, add uh, two more uh, next year, uh, October next year, to ten percent. Uh, but we are uh, it depends on um, uh, whether we. Uh, increase this uh, another additional 2%. Uh, it, it depends on the economic situations because we are trying to uh, get out of the deflation which has been uh, continue, uh, continuing uh, last 15 years in Japan. So we are, uh, our economic policy, economics is trying to uh, get out of deflation and uh, also implement uh, uh, social con uh, physical consolidation. So um, it's a tough, tough, uh, I mean, narrow path. So uh, we, uh, uh, we are doing uh, three arrows uh, policies. So uh, as you know very well about the uh, economics. So uh, it's a big challenge for us, but uh, uh, what I want to emphasize is uh, uh, innovation, technology, and uh, among them, uh, uh, the big, strong resolution, strong intention to reform our uh, society, uh, reform our uh, uh, restructure of our uh, uh, economy. So, uh, Prime Minister Abe has uh, showing is showing a very good, very strong leadership, and uh, Japanese people are now. Uh, supporting our, our policy because uh, we are in the, uh, I mean, uh, deflation uh, uh, long time. So uh, Japanese people uh, understand uh, uh, we have to do new and we have to do challenge. So uh, that's what uh, uh, we're trying to do. Mm. Yes. It's a fascinating problem that Japan faces, and one that's very different than most of Southeast Asia, where we have younger populations. Chuna mm -hmm. um, and, and Pujin, I want to get you to talk about this a little bit, because you mentioned fiscal consolidation, and we've just seen the Australian Parliament decide to take a path towards fiscal consolidation. But it seems that, and in your report you allude to this, that there is a danger that in trying to maintain a balanced budget and to protect the savings of people my age and above, uh, who have saved for a long time and don't want to see that savings inflated away, that we neglect the, the needs of the growing younger population, uh, more of a problem that Indonesia has. Um, how do we balance this, this 
emerging disparity between not just rich and poor, but the old and the young. The, young, the needs of the young need inflation, nominal, infl nominal growth in Japan, for example, or faster growth in Indonesia versus the needs of savers who, like in Japan, want to, are looking now to sort of phase themselves out of the workforce and retire. Uh, well, there is a long-term issue and a short-term issue. A long-term issue, uh, it would be good to have a balance sheet. Uh, but short-term, given the ups and the downs of an economy, uh, fiscal policy uh, need to be counter-cyclical. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, we do not make an argument, it's cut, cut, cut. Uh, but the process should be nuanced, uh, sensitive to the long-term goal, that you have a balanced sheet. Uh, <coughs> Long-term growth should be looked at as a uh, asset management model. You do not look for cash returns by a deep discount <coughs> on the underlying uh, assets. Uh, now, this is very important. So, the fiscal side, we, we should be sensitive. It should be uh, counter-cyclical. The investment side. Uh, Good investment, not highly leveraged investment, investment that will have a reasonable return. I mentioned earlier on, if uh, uh, the growth uh, rates of investment is higher than uh, real growth rates, it's problematic. Now, if you look at uh, the case of China, we probably are suffering from that case. But isn't that uh, what every single fund manager wants to achieve? Uh, well, it's, uh, we need to build a, uh, that has to do with the, uh, the term I give you its gift model, green, inclusive, value, uh, eco uh, system. Uh, and in that eco system, I talk about uh, at the macro level, there should be a better calibration of the role of the state vis-a-vis -vis the role of the market. Uh, to elaborate on that side is, now even when we look at the market, if there is a case where you only have a market for goods and services, without a market for factors of production, including capital, factors of production, land, labor, capital, and the political power continue to control factors of production. So this is the institutional environment. In that institutional environment, it will be very easy for someone to get rich very quickly. Hmm. But that won't allow uh, the whole population to have what we call shared prosperity. Okay. So with those kind of uh, uh, skewed institutional environment, uh, environments, it will give uh, two, two uh, issues. One is the issue of inequality. Mm -hmm. The other issue is the issue of <coughs> corruption. So in, in that uh, E, GIF model, uh, ecosystem, we need to be sensitive to both the micro uh, <coughs> ecosystem as well as what I call the micro uh, ecosystem to promote uh, entrepreneurship and uh, innovation. Is it just a question of having longer time horizons on your return on investment? Is that what we need to focus on? We've talked yeah. about that a lot in different meetings. Yeah. My, my concern is that we most of the things that we're thinking are good for raising equality are issues that we talked about for a very long time. It seems like the issue is really pulling those into standard policy making agendas, not just sort of talking about improving the environment and getting stakeholder support for it, but actually making it part of the evaluation of policymakers' progress. The other question, and it's a very scary one I realize for a lot of people, is it sounds like what you're saying is what we really need is a, is a much more redistributive system. So is the answer just raising taxes, you know, Harsan? Oh, I can talk about this for an hour. Please don't. <laughs> uh, I'll give you two minutes. <laughs> uh, redistribution of income. Can have positive contribution to growth if the design is right. I think that is the conclusion. Uh, redistribution means lots of things, right? Uh, tax system that can be, uh, that can be, tax system can be designed to be more progressive, mm. right? In order to make uh, redistribution of income, expenditure on uh, uh, social programs, the cash transfer mechanism and things like that will contribute to the distribution of income. Uh, the problem is, if the design is not right, it could harm the efficiency of the economy. We have to find a good balance between the efficiency based on the market mechanism and 
whatever the social value that we have to protect. So in order to do that, it seems to us that fiscal policy plays a very important role. Uh, not just fiscal policy, you know, there are labor market policies and other things, but uh, for example, in this country, in the Philippines, uh, they have introduced the so-called uh, conditional cash, cash transfer mechanism. Mm -hmm. They will transfer cash to the poor people, conditional upon their children's attendance in school, or they uh, you know, pay regular visit to healthcare services and things mm -hmm. like that. It has been very popular in Mexico and uh, Brazil, Brazil, and uh, the Philippines have introduced that. Uh, it is still in the process, in the, in, in the process of uh, you know, expanding uh, mm -hmm. the program. But there, there, there are uh, measures like that. If the design is good, uh, that is not harmful to the development of the economy and you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. The same applies to uh, consumption tax that uh, Mr. Nishimura talked about, value-added tax. Value-added tax is very friendly to economic growth. I want to stop you there and ask you to explain that in two sentences to the room why, if you talk about the need for progressive taxes, we think of a VAT, a value-added tax, as being a regressive tax by its very nature. Why would you recommend that Asia have more value-added tax? Does it mean we should be paying less income tax? I hope so. Actually, actually, if you look at the tax structure here in Asia, mm. they rely more on value-added tax than direct tax. So. If you look at the countries in this region, especially in ASEAN countries, you might want to recommend that you should rely more on income taxation rather than consumption taxation. Mm -hmm. But besides that, what I want to talk about is that, of course, value added tax or consumption tax is regressive, right? Mm -hmm. It hits the poor more than the rich. But if it is combined with the appropriate social transfer mechanisms, it should be okay. Mm -hmm. For example, in case of Japan, what they are doing, what they are trying to do is to raise tax revenues by raising the consumption tax and use the revenue for social security programs, right? That is, uh, that has an, uh, you know, redistributive impact. So how can you combine the tax issue and the spending issue? That is another issue that you have to look into very carefully. Mm. Jeremy, you mentioned that there's an aspect of this in terms of property rights is a very potent issue in Asia, too, that has contributed to inequality. Can you address that a little bit, the, the issue of a uh, very thorny issue of land title across Asia? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is um, property rights are, should be, in, in most cases, an inalienable right. Um, the reality is that in a lot of cases, People can have their land expropriated, and uh, you know, therefore, they can't build any security for themselves and for their future. These things have got to be protected. I think the uh, the the other piece of it is that if you look around the region, there are, you know, your ability to own real estate as either a as either a resident or a foreigner is very different depending on where you are, and that has an impact on your ability to to uh, provide. FDI into that country, and I was in a conversation last night about it, relationship the Philippines and Indonesia, which was was interesting because the amount of FDI going into real estate in Indonesia is far greater than the amount of FDI coming into the Philippines because of the nature of the land title and what you're able to to achieve. At the same time, when you've got very open uh, property rights, um, you know the likes of Hong Kong and such like you. When, when everybody's looking to invest in real estate, all of a sudden you create bubbles, and that's what's happened recently in both Hong Kong and Singapore, and you've, they've provided taxes, which in theory is to st stemmy, uh, stymie speculation. And actually, interestingly, it's had, uh, and the idea of that is to then bring down the price, but actually the, the, it's had a, neg had a different impact, which is that it's pretty much stopped uh, any sort of transactions in that space because the entry price is too great. Mm. So, what, you know, those two, I think, go hand in hand, um, and uh, you know it, it's important that in order to create stability in a property market, those sorts of things are very, very clear. And and the more open one can be, the greater chance one has, both from investors and developers because they get security, but also from an occupier base where you can bring to our whole issue around sustainability and inclusion best practices from elsewhere in the world into this part of the world. And uh, ultimately, the whole 
issue of then you know, better built environments um, uh, comes about. I think the other piece of it is also a lot of Asian cities, Singapore's a great example, which have done as a consequence of planning and those best practices have managed to densify themselves in such a way that, that actually they're a more sustainable city than a lot of others. Because Sorry, trans densify. Densification, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, know, you, you don't want the urban sprawl that right. exists because ultimately that cr uses resources, it takes up time and energy that, that ultimately if you densify and plan properly, mm. um, you know, that can be advantageous both to society, to the individuals living in it, but also uh, uh, you know, resources as a whole. Okay. We want to open it up for questions. I meant to do that a lot earlier, actually. I would encourage you to uh, put your hand up and, and Mike will be sent to you and just inject yourself into this conversation. Um, otherwise, we will just dominate it. Uh, there's a hand over there. Would you like to ask a question or make a comment? Please identify yourself before you Yes, thank you, you very much for the insights. Um, my name's Lauren Anderson. I'm a Sydney Global Shaper, and I work in the space of collaborative consumption or the sharing economy, which includes businesses like Airbnb or car sharing, and essentially is about uh, increased efficiency of the assets rather than the production of new assets. So I'm wondering, and uh, perhaps the question is mainly to Professor Gudrun and uh, Mr. Shinohara, uh, how can we actually look at growth uh, you know, maximizing the efficiency of existing assets as a stronger contributor to growth as opposed to the production of new assets. And potentially uh, for everyone in the East Asian region, obviously there is an aspirational wealth mindset. Uh, can a model like collaborative consumption actually overcome this mindset uh, to increase access uh, to things that are need needed? Thank you. Which, which, which of you would like to handle that one? Certainly, though, <laughs> certainly these are steps in the right direction. If I say the gift model, uh, these can be categorized under the G, green. Um, I mentioned uh, uh, many uh, labor-saving technologies vis-a-vis earth-saving earth technologies. So, I, so the way I look at what you do is uh, earth-saving institutional technology. We also come up with the term called institutional technology. That's the kind of method that we human beings uh, coordinate uh, our behavior, uh, shape our value, coordinate uh, behavior more towards the green economy, uh, more welcome in a way. Hmm. I mean, I think it's interesting that the, the problem that we face with sustainability and equality or income inequality challenges so much of the fundamentals that we've all taken for granted when we're talking about economics for the last 20 years. And one of them is <clears throat> this notion of, uh, of trade being beneficial for everyone. We probably all remember that, I think it was not even 10 years ago, there was, most of these meetings were met with great protests because there was a, a, a movement against globalization and its impact. Um, and yet now we're looking at trade as an aspect that could actually improve or reduce income inequality. This is in your report. But it seems that there's a problem between the way the trade can improve the equality between nations and in, within nations. It can become a great disruptor, right? And the way it's perceived. And so I actually think, Nishimura san, you, you're, you're considering this now, the TPP. Do you think that this, is a, this has the potential to apply a sort of a pressure for reform uh, in, in Japan that could transform industries and make uh, business more open and egalitarian? Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, TPP is a good momentum for our reform and restructure. Uh, and uh, I think uh, trade, trade will increase uh, uh, each country uh, the, uh, uh, wealth. So, uh, uh, and also, uh, uh, we uh, develop uh, new rules uh, of uh, uh, intellectual pro uh, pro property rights, uh, IPR, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, investment uh, protection uh, or uh, uh, government procurement. So uh, it's uh, transparent new rules. So, uh, and if uh, some country uh, uh, is not in, in this uh, uh, kind of a global supply chain made by TPP, uh, it will be uh, excluded. It may be excluded over uh, this uh, supply chain. So this country needs to, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, 
keep keep this uh, uh, accept this new rule. I mean IPR and uh, uh, investment protection or uh, and and, uh, and so on. So this this uh, TPP is uh, I think driving force for uh, uh, developing uh, new rules all over the world, uh, especially Asian and uh, Pacific uh, regions. True, but it faces great opposition among your domestic constituents, no? Mm. Right, right. But so uh, how, do you, how do you better sell the idea that free trade is actually good for you? Yeah, yes, but uh, each country has uh, uh, kind of uh, sensitive issues. So uh, we have to, uh, I mean, um, we need to we need to hear and uh, accept some instant, uh, uh, sensitive issues from each country. Mm. So uh, we, do, we don't want 100 percent uh, free free and the complete uh, I mean uh, framework. We need 80 percent or 85 percent is fine. So we are now negotiating in the last stage and. Uh, uh, Please look at the EU. EU is an integrated, uh, uh, I mean, economically one, mm. one area, region. But uh, each country has uh, each culture and each, I mean, um, yes. So, mm. so we need the economically integration. But uh, we, we have, uh, each country has uh, each uh, uh, sense of issues. Right. So, yes. Could you, what is the, what, it's sometimes hard for, to, to keep your mind around, get your mind around this concept of free trade, not sort of leaving people behind that are already disenfranchised or on the, on the wrong side of the income disparity. What is the rationale for why free trade would help this? Well, theoretically, uh, the benefits we get uh, from free trade is based on the idea of uh, specialization. Mm -hmm. A more concrete expression of that is uh, comparative uh, advantage of uh, different nations. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, one way to look at markets is to look at domestic markets. Then you look at the global markets. Uh, what's wrong with the, the concept of uh, comparative advantage is previously we tend to take that advantage as a static comparative advantage. But static has a beauty of elegance. It's a sort of uh, see a static picture. But what is important is for us to uh, understand that concept as a dynamic comparative advantage. Mm -hmm. So. Do you have a uh, comparative advantage? You say yes. Tomorrow, will you have a comparative advantage? You say yes, but less so. But you gain time so that you can learn new tricks. Hmm. So the world, uh, the economy, the marketplace continue to move uh, forward. So if uh, the thinking is correct, what is important is to uh, have the concept of uh, opening up of market, not open market. Uh, right away, so mm -hmm. that you gain time to adjust your uh, labor uh, skill sets. Uh, uh, you are better positioned to have uh, for jobs that have uh, higher uh, value added. Mm -hmm. Shinta, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I have to say that this issue of nationalism versus regionalism versus globalization, as is definitely very apparent. And um, when when we when we talk about uh, in in the ASEAN context, we're we're looking into how to do more um, trade creation rather than trade uh, di diversion, you know. And I think we we we're managing in terms of each of the country as a center of excellence of certain sectors, but how then we can create the single market? And I think uh, you know when we talk about opening market, um, there is still a very big uh, dilemma in terms of the nationalism itself, you know, that um, Indonesia, for example, at the moment we're going through, um, you know, where, where foreign investors start looking into Indonesia as more protectionist, you know, regulation, um, trade regulation coming out, you know, our um, negative list has just been issued, you know, um, in which, you know, we are, we are uh, closing some of the sectors, all the open mining and, export. Yeah, and, and this is a big issue at the moment that we're facing, you know. And on one side, we want to open up, you know, we are, we're negotiating right now SIPA, Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement with um, different countries, Korea, uh, South Korea, um, you know, um, EU, is, is, we are launching with EU, with Australia. And yet, we're, we're not ready for that, right? I mean, where are we? TPP is very far off, of course, from the agenda. But, you know, I think this is a big dilemma that mm. a country like Indonesia is facing. You know, uh, we don't have that kind of um, concept of 
what is really the, the positive impact if we open our market? Do you think it would have a catalyzing impact in a country like Indonesia? I know Japan and China have often looked at, China would be very interested to get into TPP, it was welcomed, and I think it has an alternative agreement as a result. But they've looked at these agreements as ways that they can say, well, we had to sign this and now we have to implement reforms that would otherwise be domestically, politically impossible. Um, I'm thinking about you know, the land acquisition situation in Indonesia has been talked about often as a, as a deterrent to foreign investment, to infrastructure investment. Um, you have a sense of this as a, as a business person, an entrepreneur. What's the situation there? Is that getting better? And do you think that uh, there's a way to increase foreign investment by signing on to trade agreements that would help catalyze, get more legislation through parliament than otherwise would happen? Yeah, I think, I think uh, of course, as you know, at our election, is coming up in July, so at the moment everything is, seems to be on hold. Uh, mm -hmm. We are, we have we are very optimistic that the new government hopefully can really, uh, you know, bring us to a, 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 a new direction of Indonesia, new hope for Indonesia. But I think what what is crucial to say is, it seems like there's a number of homework that Indonesia needs to <coughs> fulfill before we even can look at. Uh, more opening up of Indonesia, mm -hmm. and I think this is really, um, you know, reflected in the regula regulatory um, framework aspect. You know, decentralization is a very big issue. So while we are talking about globalization, this is a major issue in front of us, which is decentralization, which impact like the land acquisition and so forth is still a big issue right. till today. So I think unless we we kind of address those challenges that we face internally. I think we will continue struggling to want to be a player in this global arena. And I think um, uh, this, obviously, the timing is very important. And that's why we are looking how this effort can parallel be done simultaneously and address the home issue as well as the, the global issue. And I think um, you know, we need to really, uh, I think Indonesia new government has a very big assignment in their head. So they, they really have to, to move forward with this. Okay. Let's take open up for some more questions. I see a couple of hands going up. Any anyone from the other sections of the right? And I have a whole bunch of people behind me. I can't see, so you just have to throw something at me. In the back. Yeah, my question is for Nishimura. And in articles I read about the TPP content, uh, there are extraordinary shareholder rights to ignore laws in member countries related to environmental regulation, to bring lawsuits if regulations are more severe in their home country, to recover lost profits, uh, to challenge labor laws that they don't like. And I'm, I, I don't hear much about that in the debates, and I'm wondering if those issues have been addressed and taken out of the TPP, or if Japan, with its incredible history of environmental protection of strong labor laws, uh, is accepting those parts of the TPP agenda that I, I read about in some of the underground press uh, that we don't talk about publicly. I'm wondering, you know, is TPP really something that you should be uh, moving toward and, and how, do, how does it address or how, does, how might it impact Japan's environmental record, Japan's labor uh, law? Uh, is going forward. Good, good you question. Question. And how will it affect? Uh, before you, can you identify yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. Forward? My name is Alan Miner. I'm a venture capitalist based out of Tokyo. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what I can say uh, here is uh, so limited, and also it is sensitive issue, sensitive matter. <laughs> yes. So, so, so <laughs> let me talk a little bit about this. But uh, may I speak in Japanese? So, please uh, put the uh, headphone. Ready? You can understand Japanese. <laughs> okay. Ano, eh, you know, even if TPP, TPP wa, 21st-century framework of 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 だからこそ、これまでの例がないがゆえに時間がかかっ交渉に時間がかかってるという面があります。で、これは 
もう21世紀にまさに今日の議論と気を逸にしますけれども新しい貿易投資のルールを決めていこうという中で合意をして議論をしてますので一定のルールが貿易投資の中に誕生。And to what extent、uh, a discussion has been sorted out, and、uh, then、uh, there will be a chief negotiators meeting in July, and by then all these items will、uh, be sorted out. And when the chief negotiators meeting is held in July, all these will be worked on and lead on to the ministerial meeting scheduled to be held in July. Okay, we have a complete message. And there was another question there in the green. Thank you. I'm Vivian Lau from Junior Achievement Asia Pacific, nonprofit organization in 120 countries focused on supporting young people.、Um, on the topic of sustainable and inclusive growth, I think Professor Fu, you call for a change of mindset. I think、um, sometimes it's more than just the change of mindset. We need to have the enabling system and process to support that. Now, on the real cost of、um, resources, I think.、Um, What we are seeing right now is that our current generation is paying,、uh, is actually getting a discount. Our future generation is going to pay a premium. So I know I have this wild concept that I, would I think would terrify politicians and、uh, economists in this room. Is there a chance that we can look at real cost of pricing with a different perspective, really long term pricing? So maybe we, it's a new form of GST. But the G and the S stand for global sustainability. Maybe we shouldn't call it a tax because tax is a dirty word. So maybe it's global sustainability fund or something, which means that we should really pay for the true cost so that by the year 2060, future generation, when they look at us in this room, they know that we've done something to support them. I know it's a wild card, and I like to hear comments. Is it a wild card? I think this, I, I may be wrong, but I think this is the concept behind the carbon tax, behind yeah. carbon yeah. trading.、Um, and yeah. Indonesia, yeah, please go ahead. May I、uh, yes, come in on this one? I, I, I kind of get where you're going、uh, with this. And、uh, you know, let's take the issue of water, which is where Wayne started, and you referred to that.、Uh, water has many dimensions beyond the economic. There's, there's political dimensions, there's.、Uh, Even spiritual dimensions, environmental dimensions. And we see indeed water use is unsustainable. We see water tables, if you look at the state of Punjab, for instance, in India and Pakistan, water tables have depleted to a level. The farmers know what's happening. They know this is unsustainable. And they, we go and talk to them, they tell you, listen, this we know beyond <coughs> the next 10, 15 years it won't last. But if I don't do this, all my neighbors are going to take the water anyway. Right? The, the depleting groundwater levels in Bangladesh have led to levels of arsenic in the water、uh, supply system that has, that has then entered the food chain and have a huge healthcare cost for, for, for humanity. So there is no doubt that there has to be some way of appropriately recognizing this cost. That this resource has. Unfortunately, the moment you talk of cost as allocated to a resource like that, the first reaction is always emotional.、Yeah? And there's no doubt that water, access to clean, safe drinking water is a fundamental human right. But that usage of water for drinking, for cooking, for personal hygiene is not more than a couple of percent of the total freshwater resources we have. The bulk of the freshwater resources we have are actually used in agriculture, 70%. And the research seems to indicate that the amount of water used in agriculture is two to two and a half times the physiological requirement of the plants themselves. 
because of losses due to transpiration, losses because of percolation, and simply overuse of water. So a proper pricing mechanism in some way uh, with communities participating, because they see the cost. Communities and the farmers know the cost. Participating in this would definitely go a long way, but it's, a, it's, a, it's politically a very difficult transition to make. Nandu, I, I think the issue of pricing these commodities would take us about six hours to even cover the basic <laughs> yeah. issues. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. But very quickly, I wanted to try to draw you back to something you referred to earlier, which is Fujin talked about, uh, and, and Shino Harasong talked about uh, wealth transfers. Is there a way, in the context of your investment, you talked about investment in the rural sector and the agricultural sector, is there a way to get the private sector involved more directly? Uh, in looking at a longer time horizon for returns and in getting engaged with governments in trying to create these wealth transfers on a commercial level? Let, let me give you a simple example, yeah? and, and then you tell me. And this is, this is an example from uh, our, our business in Pakistan. Right? Uh, we have a business that's about 80 billion rupees, Pakistani rupees. Of this 80 billion rupees, where does the revenue go? 80 billion rupees, cash. 20 billion goes to farmers directly, wealth transfer, form of cash that is transferred on a daily basis for the milk and raw materials we supply. Another 20 billion goes for other raw materials and packaging materials. 20 billion goes to indirect taxes, transportation, uh, interest costs, etc. And 20 billion that's left over is split three ways between employee salaries, direct taxes, and shareholder profits. Mm. Now, if I look at that as a model, as a capitalist, and I put this equation about the wealth transfer that's happening into the rural economy, into the hands of individual small farmers, yeah, and the money that's actually being split between direct taxes and profits and employees, this is a sustainable business model mm. because you have wealth transfers integrated into the way you operate. And mm. that is a sustainable business model that we need to work with. Shinta, what, what do you think? I want to get your opinion because you're from a country that is still largely rural. Do you think that that resonates with you in terms of a workable business model in Indonesia? Well, actually, the government has tried, as you know, um, um, a, few, a few years ago, they, they're reducing, they tried to reduce um, subsidy and then creating a program of what we call the wealth transfer, I mean, a cash transfer program for, right. the, uh, uh, for more for the poor. Unfortunately, it didn't really work very well. You know, and I, I think this concept of wealth transfer as a model seems to be good, but in actual implementation, it's not as simple as what you know it's, it's uh, appearing to say. And I think, the, the, you know, coming back again on what the government is doing, you know, these policies. I think it has to be clear that, um, you know, for example, we're at the moment we're negotiating in terms of the um, social security. For, for labor, you know, um, and for for employees, and where where does the cost go? Okay, and they want to say this is all employer responsibility. So basically, five percent, you know, all employers' responsibility, mm. and so they they want to basically the cost will lies on the employers, not the employees, mm. and this is always this is an ongoing problem in Indonesia because you're trying to create uh, policies and uh, that that is really uh, pro, specific, you know, the, of course, the major population in where labor is, and then yet, you know, it's it's impacting negative to do to the to the employer side, which is a certain segment of the of the society. So, I think, you know, how can you create this balance um, in terms of when we, we look at the wealth transfer? How can this be implemented properly, mm -hmm. and how can can you know you can have a, a, a fairness in terms of Yes, of course, certain costs needs to go here, but you know, how do you actually execute it? I right. think is the problem. So let me, let me stop you there and, and open up for what we have time for just one more question, and I want to make sure we do get a couple of those in, and and we ha and then we'll all be heading off for that. I know everyone's eager to get to the lunch. Um, over in the back. Thank you. My name is Yosef from uh, the Auckland Hub Global Shapers Community. Um, we're talking about ecosystems. And ecosystems come from a natural world, sort of our understanding of the natural world. And uh, uh, ecosystems work towards equilibrium. Um, when you think about growth, 
have we become overly obsessed with growth that it's affecting us negatively? Can you, is the question, how, how do we become so obsessed with growth that it's affecting us negatively? Is our obsession with growth oh. affecting us negatively? Okay. Do we? Bujin, you want to take that one? Uh, well, that, that's uh, when we look at the existing uh, model of uh, growth. Uh, well, we, we did not make a very strong argument against the existing model, but in practice of the existing model, land, labor, capital, land, of course, uh, stands for it's a more concrete uh, term for uh, the celestial, celestial uh, constraints we all face. It's land, including uh, water. In the, pra in the practice of uh, existing uh, model, we have not been sensitive enough to what we call the carrying capacity of Earth. Uh, now, consistent with the economic principles, if uh, resources are limited, uh, there must be uh, better mechanisms for better pricing of uh, those uh, resources. Uh, but uh, now we are probably conceptually more clear. The next challenge for us is to communicate that message to governments, to business, uh, to every sector of society, so that uh, we have a better chance mm. uh, for the growth to be more sustainable. Of course, uh, it will be a challenge, uh, but we, the better to start talking about what we call gift model. Uh, okay. Green, inclusive, new value, uh, a better ecosystem for entrepreneurship and uh, uh, innovation so that uh, we have a better chance to survive altogether. All right, why don't we try to wrap it up there and I'll try to sum it before we all head out. I, mean, I think, I'm not sure if your acronym will necessarily take off, but I think the spirit behind it definitely will. There needs to be a clearer alignment and a recognition. And I think these kind of conversations will help that to some extent. The governments realize it's not just enough to come up with a positive growth figure, because for years we thought if you can produce the growth, you can stay in power. That's clearly no longer the case. I think every government in the region from Japan to China to Southeast Asia recognizes that. Um, obviously, we need to get more serious about trying to create a more realistic pricing model for scarce resources. Uh, a smarter tax structure, uh, some kind of conditional wealth transfers should be explored that can help mitigate the impact of freer trade and, and, and uh, developed capital markets. Uh, property rights, I think, is a paramount issue for Southeast Asia and most of Asia. Land reform was never really fully implemented in much of the region. I think in this country in particularly, it's a process and it hasn't been fully completed. Um, Japan, I think politicians there will also have to engage others in the region about trying to create a better awareness and understanding of why free trade is good. And as our audience suggested, I think that it, more has to be done to try to not only just explain this to the public, but to find ways to create those opportunities so they can move and, and adapt and benefit fully from those, those, those agreements. So why don't I leave it there? And, uh, and I'm sorry we had to run out of time, but um, I know there's uh, a, a big motion to go to the lunch, the Indonesian lunch. <laughs> Right across me, and I'll thank the panelists for their time and taking part in their insights. And I'll thank all of you for coming and sharing your thoughts too. Thank you. Thank you.